our guest, our special guest to you. Dr. Christopher Yuan is a professor at Moody Bible Institute, teaches the Bible there, has for a dozen years, speaks all over the world uh, in universities, colleges, churches, and other venues and conferences about the issues of faith, scripture, and sexuality. And we're blessed to have him here. He's uh, author of a book with his mother. He co-authored, Angela, called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God and a Broken Mother's uh, Search for Hope. And I encourage you, th that resource is available uh, here this morning as you leave, if you'd like to pick that up. It's a great uh, resource to have. Also an author of his most recent book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, uh, how God's grand story shapes our, our desires and, and marriage and, and so on. It's a fantastic read. I really encourage you to read that as well. But their ministry together, he's joined also by his father, Dr. Leon Yuan, who is two PhDs, and I was told that makes him a paradox. <laughs> it's not my joke, it's theirs. But we're, we're thrilled to have the Yuans with us, and their, their story, and more than that, their shared ministry of grace and faith and truth is a great gift to, to our community, our culture in, in this needed moment, and to us. So will you join me in welcoming Dr. For Yuan and his, his family, Dr. Leon and Angela Yuan. America, where money grows on trees <laughs> and streets are lined with gold. Well, at least that's what I perceived when I first passed through Ellis Island of New York City on October 30th, 1964. But I quickly realized how wrong I was. The first night I stayed in my friend's rundown apartment in the slum of Harlem. Even more surprising was the day after, October 31st, when little people wear masks, <laughs> ring doorbells, and said, trick or treat. I said to myself, what, heck, what have I got myself into? <laughs> and Angela, my college sweetheart, came a few months later, and we married the next year. I also assumed, just because we were in love, we will simply live happily ever after. How naive I was. <laughs> we were not Christian then after years of unresolved issue and self-centered living, our marriage was a disaster. So with the encouragement from both of our sons, we began the paperwork for divorce after 28 years of marriage. So on that year, May 15th, 1993, our son Christopher came home after his first year in dental school. He made the announcement, I am gay. Since our marriage was hopeless, I did not work as a team with my wife to face this enormous challenge. Not only did I not comfort her, but I also accused her making our son gay. Christopher's declaration, my son Christopher's declaration, affirmed my belief that we should all go our separate ways. Let him be, because there's nothing I can do about it besides. Is it, isn't it more important to be happy? But my wife responded quite differently. You will never think that three simple words, I am gay, could cause so much pain. I actually thought I could threaten Christopher with an ultimatum to choose the family or choose homosexuality. But Christopher already bore into the lie that he couldn't change, that he was born gay. So he said, if you cannot accept me, I have no other choice but to leave. Without any hesitation, Christopher picked up his bags and left. Nothing can describe how I felt at that moment. It was worse than receiving news of Christopher's death. He could have cut me with a knife. It would have hurt less. In my mind, Christopher was closest to me, and my last ray of hope had also betrayed me. I was at the end of my rope as my world fell apart around me. I had no more reason to live. So I determined to do the unthinkable. I was going to end my life. Even though 
I was not a Christian at that time. I felt the need to meet with a minister who gave me a pamphlet on homosexuality. Then I bought a one-way Amtrak ticket to Louisville, where I planned to say goodbye to Christopher for the last time before ending it all. With only my purse and the pamphlet from the minister, I bought on the train, thinking that death was the only answer to all my problems. Never be much a reader. On the train, I began to read a pamphlet, which explained the plan of salvation, that all of us are sinners, yet God loves us in spite of our sin. God opened the eyes of my heart. Then I realized that just as God loves me in spite of my sin, I could love Christopher in spite of him living as a gay man. After arriving in Louisville, I caught a number from the back of the pamphlet and was connected to a Christian lady who began to disciple me. For six weeks, I immersed myself into the Bible and felt as if I couldn't soak up enough. You see, I went to Louisville expecting to end my life. In reality, I did. One of my favorite verses today is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. After six weeks, I got a phone call from the lady who was discipling my wife. The lady was very, very excited. She told me, your wife has surrendered her life to Jesus Christ. She has been saved. I was not very pleased. I told her this is not a good news. This is my worst nightmare because from now on, she has God on her side. <laughs> but what I realized, her transformation was not a Sunday only change, but affected every aspect of her life. What she had was not religion, but an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Little did I know God was also work on me. So I started to go to church with her. Then a friend of ours invited us to a Bible study called BSF, Bible Study Fellowship, where we grow deeper into the understanding of and love for God and his word. While well studying the Bible in my church and in BSF, I also surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. God became the guru, kept our marriage together by drawing both of us to himself. This was God's way for preparing us for the difficult years ahead. As our son Christopher walked further and further away from God, for my childhood years, I was like most other Chinese-American kids. Obey your parents, do well in school, and of course, practice piano. You see, I didn't fit in with the other American boys. I looked different, I acted different, and I had different interests. God had given me the gifts of music, of sensitivity, and Satan can't take away those God-given gifts, but he can twist the perception of them. And from a young age, I was viewed and ridiculed as being effeminate. The first time I remember having these attractions was when I was nine years old, after I came across pornography at, at my friend's house at nine. At that young age, I was confused and afraid of those feelings. Without any parental guidance on sexuality, those magazines gave me a distorted view of sex, and they soon became my master. With pornography fueling my desires, I had my first encounter when I was 16 years old, but I kept my feelings hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps Reserves. In my early 20s, I started secretly going out to the gay clubs. Then when I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, where I was pursuing my doctorate, I no longer kept it a secret, and I came out of the closet. I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs, and I went from relationship to relationship seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found, but it still left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs. Now, to be clear, not all gay men are promiscuous or do drugs. Some are, some are not. But unfortunately, that is part of my story. And when I tell you it, I have to be honest and tell you the whole thing. But I also want to tell you that when you encounter Christ, he will impact every aspect of your life. 
So I began experimenting with drugs, but to pay for my habit, I started selling drugs. And I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. You see, I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was to receive my doctorate, the administration expelled me. So my parents flew from Chicago, where we're from, to Louisville, and I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school. My dad's a dentist. He knew the dean very well. All they needed to do was to threaten a lawsuit, and I would stay in school for three months and get my doctorate. Besides, isn't that what any good Chinese parents should do anyway? <laughs> to my surprise, as we sat there in the dean's office, my mother looked at the dean and said, it's not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. And she told the dean that they're going to support whatever decision the school made. See, my mom knew that when it comes to her kids, nothing is more important than her children following Jesus. Even more important than education, even more important than career. But oftentimes in America, many times people may go to church on Sunday and worship God, but then they'll return home and worship idols. For example, the idol of education, the idol of career, the idol of their 401k. And in essence, we often make our children do the same. Think about this. Our parents putting more emphasis upon their children getting their homework done, getting a better grade, getting into a, into a good school. Or should Christian parents be putting the most emphasis upon their children following Jesus? Nothing is more important than following Christ. But I have to be honest with you, I was not happy about my mom's decision. She wasn't on my side, I felt. She was on the school side. So I moved further away from them to the bright lights and big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community. And I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator, because in my world, I had become God. Leah and I had no idea that Christopher was doing drugs, but we knew his biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So I sent him Christian cards several times a week, and I filled them with encouraging words, scripture, and hymns. At the bottom of each card, I sign, love you forever, Ma. But little did I know he never read them and simply tossed them into the trash. My wife and I knew the only way, if we want to see our son, we have to fly from Chicago to Atlanta, so we did. But on the second day, he kicked us out, not even allow us to call a friend to pick us up. Before leaving, I offered Christopher my very first Bible. Not surprisingly, he refused. But I left it on his counter anyway and walked out the door. We found out later he took my Bible, threw it into the trash. It was more than obvious that he was totally unreachable and completely hopeless. But my wife and I committed not to focus on our own hopelessness but on the promises of God. Along with over 100 prayer warriors from our own church and from BSF, we cry out to God for our son Christopher. My wife began to pray a very bold prayer. God, do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for eight years. Once fasted 39 days for our son Christopher. Every morning, she would literally spend hours inside her prayer closet on her knee, reading the Bible, interceding for Christopher, praying for herself, for me, for many others. She wrote out 
some of her prayers, and following is one of those prayers. I was staying in the gap for Christopher. I was staying until the victory is won, until Christopher's heart changes. I was staying in the gap every day, and there I will fervently pray. And Lord, just one favor, don't let me waver. If things get quite rough, which they may, I will never give up on that son, nor will you. Though the enemy seeks to destroy, I will not quit as I intercede, though it may take years. But I give you my fears and tears and trust every moment I plead. I prayed those prayers for eight years, and it seemed that God was not answering them. But during those years, God did answer my prayers, just not in the way I expect. His answer for me was, wait, be still, and know that I am God. Looking back upon those years when I prayed for change, God did bring change. The change was not yet in Christopher, but the change was in me and my husband. What God intended for that time was that we will be changed, that we will be transformed, that we will be trophies of God's mercy. Oswald Chambers said, we are not here to prove God answers prayer. We are here to be living monuments of God's grace. As we live out those years of waiting, we learn to walk and live as monuments of his grace as God drew us to himself each and every day. Often answered a prayer doesn't come quickly, and this definitely was not an exception. But my parents were unwavering in their faithfulness to intercede on my behalf. Like the persistent widow, my mother bombarded heaven with her prayers. She knew that it was gonna take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I opened up my door and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and my drugs and I was charged with the street value equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I had started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in the Atlanta City Detention Center. So I tried calling my friends. You know those type of friends that say, whenever you need something, just give me a call. <laughs> those friends that actually get me more to trouble than anything else. What I didn't know was that I had a praying mother at home. Watch out. And she knew that as long as I had those type of friends around, I would find no need for God and no need for my parents. Remember she loved bold prayers? Well, she had prayed specifically years ago that somehow, some way, God would cause all of those friends to desert me. And on that day, not one friend answered my collect call. So mothers, beware of your prayers. They're going to come true. <laughs> so I was down to the bottom of the list. Home. And I did not want to make that phone call. As I imagined the earful that I was going to get on the other line. But my mother's first words were, son, are you okay? No condemnation, no berating words, just words of unconditional love and grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Notice Paul isn't saying that it's God's anger. It's not God's wrath. 
but it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my mom was excited to get that phone call, if you can believe it or not, because I hadn't called home in years. And she knew without a doubt that this was God's answer to her prayers. So she hung up that phone, fighting back the tears she knew she had to do like that good old hymn says. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down. Next to the phone was a calculator. She tore off a little piece of the adding machine tape, and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is, is in a safe place compared to before. And he called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list and counting her blessings. And today, this list of blessings is longer and taller than she is. Both sides. <laughs> Three days later, I was walking around the cell block. And I passed by this garbage can, and I thought, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class suburb of Chicago. My father has two doctorates. I was only three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. With my head down, I was about to pass by that garbage can. But something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, I picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell. I opened up that good book. For the first time, I read through the entire Gospel of Mark. But you know, I wasn't thinking this is the Word of God. Actually, I simply thought that I've got a lot of time on my hands and I better pass it somehow. But as some of you know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper. But what we have in our Bibles is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion, and it wasn't a pre sight and I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called into the nurse's office. The nurse sat me down, and I knew something wasn't right. So she resigned to writing something on a piece of paper and slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down, and I saw three letters and a symbol. It read HIV positive. A few days before Christmas, I received Christopher's phone call from jail. The noise in the background could not cover up his sad and hopeless words. Mom, I am HIV positive. His solemn and weak voice trailed off as my body went limp. I felt dizzy, and the world around me seemed to stop. Ever since Christopher told us he was gay, I had lived with this constant fear that Christopher might one day contract this deadly virus. My worst nightmare was now a reality. Christopher was sentenced to six years in federal prison, but news of his HIV status was like a death sentence. A verdict I could not accept. Hang up the phone. The pains of grief torn in my broken heart like a knife. Endlessly, I stumbled up the steps and dragged my heavy body into my prayer closet. Under the cross, I fell to my knees as stinging tears burned my eyes. This affliction was more than I could bear. 
in the silence of my sorrow. A melody began to play in my heart, the soft and sweet stream of a hymn. Fill my ears and repeat over and over. It is well. It is well with my soul. Sing with us. A few days after receiving that devastating news, I was in my prison cell all by myself, and really contemplating the mess that I've made of my life. I lie in my bed and I looked up at the coal metal bunk above me and somebody had scribbled something and it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You see, at the most hopeless point in my life, the Lord God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation in Israel to tell me that regardless of who I was and what I'd done in my past, he still, he still had a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me. But God gave me enough faith and enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. My transformation was gradual. God was convicting me of my dependencies, obviously drugs, Within a few months, God delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing to mind other idols. And there was one that I felt like I just couldn't let go of, and it was my sexuality. So I went to a chaplain, and I asked him his opinion. And to my surprise, the chaplain actually told me the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. And he even gave me a book explaining that view. So with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. And can I just tell you, from a purely human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God his word and his unmistakable condemnations against same-sex relationships. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of Scripture looking for justification. I wouldn't find any type of a positive affirmation for a monogamous same-sex relationship. So I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I couldn't find any. 
So I was at a turning point, and a decision had to be made. Either abandon God and his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship. By allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship. How? By freeing myself from my sexuality, by not allowing my desires to control who I am and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I realized that my sexuality should not be the core of who I am. I told myself before that God loves me unconditionally, and that's true. But don't we as sinners, don't we like to add to God's truth? I added, so therefore, he doesn't want me to change. Similar to your friends who say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. Let me say it again. Unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. You see, my identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires, whether they're sexual, romantic, or any desires. My identity is not gay. It is not ex-gay. It is not even heterosexual for that matter, because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy, for I am holy. I, did, I thought in the past that if I were to become a Christian, that I would have to become a heterosexual, which meant that the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if I had opposite such attractions, I would still need to flee temptation. I would still need to resist sin. So actually, heterosexuality is not the goal. If you think about it, God never says, be heterosexual, for I am heterosexual. But neither did God say, be homosexual, for I am homosexual. Rather, God said, be holy, for I am holy. So therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That's not the goal. But the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin struggle is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling or tempted, because we all will be struggle, we all be tempted, we all will struggle. But I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity. Because change is not the absence of temptations. God doesn't promise you that you won't be tempted, but change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling, not whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. As I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life, and he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison of all places. And I realized it didn't matter where I was, whether I was in prison or out of prison, because my calling would remain the same regardless of the location. And with that change of heart, God did another miracle. He shortened my sentence from six years to three years, which is actually almost unheard of in the federal system. So with only about a year left of my prison sentence, I knew that if I was going to continue on a ministry after prison, I'd better learn more about the Bible than just prison religion. So I called them, collected my parents, told them I think God's calling me into ministry. And then I asked them to mail me an application to the only Bible college I had ever heard of at that time called Moody Bible Institute. But then there was silence on the other line because I think they both dropped their phones. <laughs> <laughs> they mailed the application into me to prison. I was so excited when I got it. I tore it open, began filling it out, writing my essays until I got to the last page where they asked me for references. Not from anybody, but these had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. I had some slim pickings in prison. 
but I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another prison inmate to write my references to Moody. So amazingly, Moody actually accepted me. I was released from prison in July of 2001, and I started the very next month in August of 2001. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? I graduated from Moody 2005, went on to my master's in exegesis from Wheaton College Graduate School in 20, 2007, and then 2014, I received my doctorate of ministry from Bethel Seminary, and then back in 2011, I had the incredible honor of co-authoring a book with my mother called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. So we... My mom and I wrote this together. She wrote chapter one, I wrote chapter two, she wrote chapter My mother wrote all the odd chapters, I wrote the even chapters because we wanted to tell you from our own voice how you can have the same situation told from two totally different perspectives, a parent, a prodigal. And the best part is how God and his power and his grace brought us all back together. This book now is in seven different languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and it's in 100, over 100,000 in print. And we found out lately that several Christian high schools are using this book as a textbook. Actually, Aurora Christian, uh, is it Aurora Christian School, isn't that just down the road? Uh, one of the teachers there has been using it for the past nine years, a whole month. They're talking, it's called Holy Sexuality Month, the seniors. And actually, because they've been doing it for so long, the juniors hear about it and look forward to it. Uh, Mr. Warner said, I have the hardest time making my students read their textbooks not this one. Praise the Lord. I mean, we never thought that our book, we wrote it for parents, for the church, never thought it'd be used as a tool to teach our kids, but it makes sense. I hope you realize this, parents. Our little ones, our kids, sometimes from kindergarten, from pre-K, are being intentionally inundated with resources, messages, stories about sexuality that's contrary to God's will. And unfortunately, oftentimes, we stand by and do little or nothing. You know, the job to teach sex education, I believe, actually doesn't, shouldn't rest primarily in the hands of the public schools. Amen? You, you know whose main responsibility it should be? Mothers and fathers. And I'm going to add something to that. Not just parents, grandparents. Even great-grandparents. Any great-grandparents great here? How many grandparents? Grandparents and great-grandparents. You know, you know why I'm saying that? You have too much time on your hands. <laughs> but to be serious... Grandparents, great-grandparents, think back when you were teenagers, just a few years ago, when you were teenagers. How often did you listen to your parents? Or how often do you, uh, your peers at that time, listen to your, the parents? Maybe grandparents, great-grandparents, you have more of a listening ear to your grandchildren, to your great-grandchildren, than the parents do. Are we using that to shape and form this younger generation for the glory of Christ? Let's do that. Let's commit to forming and shaping our youth. Any, any people want to do that? Any, any parents, grandparents want to shape and, and point our kid to the beauty of biblical sexuality? So actually, I know parents who are getting that book and they're reading it with their kids. Like even nine-year-old. I mean, that's not too early. This, we, we were in Oklahoma. This grandmother she made a beeline to our book table. We got to her. She made a beeline. She's like, I need 10 books. I was like, wow, you just need one. She's like, no, young man, I need 10. One for myself, nine for my grandchildren. I'm going to mail every one of my grandchildren a book, and I'm going to read it with them. Not just mail it to them, read it with them, and she's going to discuss it with them. This little grandmother, that's a grandmother that's actually taking seriously the God-given responsibility we all have to not expose but equip our kids on the beauty of biblical sexuality. Silence is no longer an option. Amazingly then, um, I had the opportunity to write my new book called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, Sex, Desire, and Relationships Shaped by God's Grand Story. Because oftentimes we hear messages about biblical sexuality as don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And those are important messages. 
but we can't build a Christian life on God's no. So what is God's yes? Holy sexuality is simply chastity in singleness or faithfulness in marriage. And when I say marriage, it's the only way that God is defined between a man and woman. Chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage. And that is good news for all. Amazingly, God has given us back the years that the locusts have taken away. And my parents and I, we travel around the nation, around the world as a two-generational ministry. How cool is that? Talking about God's grace and God's truth on this issue of sexuality. And then as if that wasn't a big enough blessing, God has a sense of humor because he's brought me back to Moody where I'm now teaching in the Bible department. So I went from prisoner to professor. How about that for a resume? <laughs> but God, <laughs> praise the Lord. But God has done far, far more abundantly beyond all that we have asked or thought. You know, I look back upon our story that we just told. Very extraordinary or maybe exceptional and a unique that seems so much to focus upon this prodigal. To be honest, our story isn't just about one prodigal. It's about a family of prodigals. Every one of us was or still is a prodigal. And I don't doubt here right now there are people who have prodigals. A prodigal cousin, a prodigal daughter, a prodigal uncle, a prodigal neighbor. And things may seem hopeless. And you're just ready to throw in the towel. Or maybe you already have. May I remind you that in your hopelessness, we don't serve a God of hopelessness. He is the God of hope. Jesus is our hope. And when things seem bleak, remember that it is only God who can take hopelessness and turn it into hope. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the hope that we have, not just in something that is abstract, but hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Lord God, thank you that you gave us your son Christ not just to be an example, not just to be one who bore our sins, but one who makes us righteous by grace through faith in Christ. So God, I pray that we would put our identity in you and nothing else not in our jobs, not in our hobbies, not in our education, not in our friends, not even in our sexuality. But we would put our identity solely in the one who created us, and it's you, O oh God. Amen. Father, we praise you. We love you. O oh God, help us to love you more than life. We ask this in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus, the Messiah. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Let's thank Dr. Ewan and his parents.